Howdy folks, and welcome to another episode of Mingles with Jingles, and it has been one hell of a week. My ISP died just before last weekend. Uh, I phoned them up and said, there appears to be a problem with my internet service. They said, oh, well, we'll, um, yeah, we'll send an engineer around. But unfortunately, everybody in your area was calling up and saying there appears to be a problem with your internet service. So all of our engineers are busy. We can't get one out to you until Wednesday next week, which was five days after I'd made the phone call. They said if we get the problem fixed, though, um, which we probably will before Wednesday next week, we're going to cancel the engineer appointment. So, OK, fair enough. Well, it did take five full days and they did cancel the engineer appointment and I did eventually get my internet connection back. In the meantime, praise the Lord for Fallout 4, the game that just keeps on giving. If it wasn't for Fallout 4, I might have actually been forced to leave the house and find something to do uh, last week while my internet connection was down. Um, I... I don't really have that many problems with my ISP. 95% of the time they're absolutely fantastic. The ping and the download speed and the bandwidth and everything is just great. But then you get that 5% of the time when nothing works. I know there are other ISPs. People are saying, Jingles, you should... You know what? I might actually consider upgrading to a business connection. I'm going to investigate that. Because at the moment I'm just a regular home user. I'm with Virgin Media, in case anybody was wondering and they are very very good they've got the fastest download speeds and the most bandwidth in the country um but when they go wrong <laughs> they really really go wrong they don't go wrong that often but it always seems to be in the summer usually around about the time of the uh summer holidays when all the kids are off and everybody's using their internet but anyway i've got it back and not before bloody time because it's been one hell of a week we got a new patch for World of Tanks, we got the British battleships and a new patch, not just the British battleships, brand new graphical effects in World of Warships, firing the main battery guns is glorious now. <laughs> and also the British battleships, obviously there's a new patch for Armoured Warfare, um, although hardly anybody cares because hardly anybody plays Armoured Warfare, but you know, I had to download and install that as well. And just about the only thing that could keep me away from playing the British battleships Although I did have a... Well, I had... I kind of logged in and free XP'd my way up to the HMS Monarch at Tier 8, but I didn't bother to play because I was also downloading and installing the new expansion for XCOM, War of the Chosen. And I have been so obsessed with that game since it came out. I have recorded terabytes. I'm almost through the campaign again already. Um, and I've recorded everything. I've killed all three of the Chosen, um, and I'm working on stopping the Avatar project. But I'll tell you what, you know, it's a mark of how engrossed you're getting into a game, because when I'm recording video, I usually... I've, well, I've got two methods of recording video. I've got Bandicam, which is very, very good screen capture software. And because I have, uh, because I have an NVIDIA graphics card, I also have access to Shadowplay, which is a fantastic utility um, that will record up to the last 20 minutes of whatever game you've been playing. So as long as you remember to hit the, re the save button, at least every 20 minutes you've got an uninterrupted record of whatever it is you've been playing. And it's a mark of how good XCOM 2 War of the Chosen has been that I have let hours go by <laughs> completely just engrossed in the gameplay before thinking oh when was the last time i recorded <laughs> i haven't saved it oh shit um and it's a shame because it's usually when the most exciting stuff is happening that i forget <laughs> because i'm concentrating on what's going on so there have been some gaps in the footage um but don't worry it'll it'll all come together in the edit i'm sure it'll be fine <laughs> So, yeah, I've really, really been kicking the arse out of XCOM 2 over the course of the last week. I just haven't been playing anything else. Well, that's not strictly true, because the one thing that has managed to tear me away from XCOM 2 this week, and it wasn't World of Tanks, it wasn't the British battleships in World of Warships, it wasn't Armoured Warfare, it wasn't World of Warcraft patch 7.3, they've opened up the Assault on Argus in there, although I'm sure most of you don't care about that. Um... 
I was browsing my Steam Discovery queue and a Warhammer 40,000 game popped up that I'd never heard of. It's uh, Warhammer 40,000 Inquisitor Martyr. It's a bit of a clumsy title, but uh, I'd never heard of it. So I watched the videos and thought, this looks very good. But then again, I've been burned by Warhammer 40,000 games that look very good before. Space Hulk Deathwing, for example, which I foolishly bought, installed and played purely on the basis of well, one, the fact that it was Warhammer 40,000. Two, the fact that it was Space Hulk. Um, you got the stomp around giant abandoned Space Hulks in Terminator power armor carving up gene stealers and chaos cultists and all sorts of stuff. But the problem was, well, that's basically all you did. You just mowed down waves and waves and waves of bad guys with... It was just so boring and repetitive that no amount of atmosphere could make up for it. So it was a terrible, terrible game. Inquisitor Martyr, on the other hand, well, it managed to tear me away from XCOM 2, War of the Chosen, for a good six to seven hours. So, well, here's the thing. It, it's, kind of, it's kind of difficult to describe what the game's about. And it's next to impossible so far for me to... What I'd love to do is actually show you some video footage of what the game is about. Um, unfortunately, Bandicam keeps crashing the game so I can't record it with Bandicam, and Shadowplay doesn't even recognise the fact that the game's up and running, so I'm, <laughs> I'm a little bit stuck at the moment uh, to find any kind of software that can actually capture the gameplay. Although I may try playing it in windowed mode and recording it using Bandicam that way. That might work, I'll have to give it a shot. Jingles, stop waffling, get to the point. What's the game like? What's it about? Okay, okay. Well, I'll, I'll have a stab at describing it. It's kind of like Diablo 3. It's kind of like Space Hulk and it's kind of like Destiny all at the same time. It's like Destiny in that you spend your time between missions, you know, when you're actually out and about shooting things and carving them up, um, on the command bridge of a starship. And it's from here that you access your inventory and your crafting and the shop and your star map where you choose which system you're going to descend upon next. And then when you do pick a mission, when you accept a mission and off you go, um, when you're playing single player at least, then it's like Destiny in that respect, in that off you go, an instance is generated for you, um, and you play through it until you reach the end. And then you're back to the command bridge of your ship where you select your next mission, sort out your inventory, equip your upgrades, and so on and so on and so on. Now when you actually accept a mission and start actually playing the game, the gameplay is very, very similar to Diablo, except Diablo with a Warhammer 40,000 skin. You're there stomping through space hulks or carving your way across the surface of a planet. The levels are all randomly generated. Um, there are hordes of enemies for you to kill, all kinds of loot for you to collect. And it's got a sort of combat system a little bit, in fact, a lot like the way it works in Guild Wars 2, where you can set your character up. Uh, with two different weapon sets, which you will switch between depending on the situation. So, for example, you might have a plasma rifle or a las gun or an auto gun in your primary weapon slot for dealing with enemies at range, and then when they get close, you switch to your secondary weapon build, which might include a storm shield and a chainsaw for carving them up in close quarters combat. It works very, very well. In fact, it's probably safe to say that the game does borrow a little bit here and there from a lot of other different games, but it, it, it all... It all works very, very well. I am hesitant to recommend it, however. And not because there's anything wrong with the game. I've really enjoyed playing it. It's it's in alpha, but it's surprisingly stable, even though it doesn't really work very well with any kind of screen capture software so far. Other than that, very stable. Um, there are some placeholder elements in place, but that's to be expected from a game that's in alpha. Now, the reason why, despite the overwhelmingly positive reviews that the game's received on Steam, the reason why I would hesitate to recommend it is because it's a full price early access title. This game will cost you 30 pounds and 59 pence to join the early access, or whatever that is in your local currency. It's a lot of money for an early access title, and you don't get any special benefit from signing up for early access, other than getting to play the game. Your character progression gets wiped when the game goes live, the same as anybody else. You don't get any kind of pre-order bonuses or anything like that. You just get the privilege of playing the game while it's in early access. So for that reason and that reason only, I would 
hesitate to recommend Warhammer 40,000 Inquisitor Martyr, despite the fact that I have had a lot of fun playing it. It is fiendishly addictive. Um, I'm going to try to get some kind of video footage of the game recorded, so I, I can do a, a more in-depth preview of it, but just bear in mind that price point. All you Warhammer 40,000 fanboys out there, this is a very, very good uh, online persistent universe Warhammer 40,000 action role-playing game, but it's expensive. So think carefully before you dip your hand into your pocket. Nevertheless, I have been enjoying it. Uh, I do think it's good. I don't know if it's worth that amount of money, but it is good. Anyway, moving along swiftly. What else happened while my internet connection was down? Let's talk about iChase. Since World of Warships is playing, and that was the big drama last week, for those of you who don't know him, iChase is one of the bigger and probably one of the more respected World of Warships video producers on YouTube. He's part of the North American World of Warships Community Contributor Program, or he was, <laughs> in an incident reminiscent of the whole Sir Fosh incident in World of Tanks EU, Wargaming have done it again. I'll cut a very long story short. Premium Tier 8 German aircraft carrier, the Graf Zeppelin, initially released to testers, and it was pretty good. And everybody put videos up saying, this ship's pretty good. And then Gamescom happened, and in the EU gift shop, they released the Graf Zeppelin. But it wasn't the same Graf Zeppelin that everybody had previewed. Now, we know their work's in progress, and so on and so on. But they did the changes and released it, given nobody any time whatsoever to reevaluate the ship. And possibly put fresh videos up saying, well, the ship has changed. And now it's a massive steaming turd, because it was a massive steaming turd. I won't bore you with the details, but it was just bad. So everybody complained, and Wargaming said, <laughs> I'm not making this up. There's nothing wrong with the ship. You just need to get good. <laughs> We're talking some highly respected aircraft carrier players in World of Warships. All said, my god, what have you done to this ship? It stinks. And Wargaming's reply was, you're all scrubs, you just need to get good. So I Chase put a video up basically saying this. And he wasn't the only one, of course, but he's the one that got singled out. Um, I Chase's video said, amongst other things, this ship sucks. The people responsible for making these changes have no idea what they're doing and should be fired. And that was the point that Wargaming latched onto, but he also said, if you've paid money for this ship, I recommend you raise a support ticket and demand a refund, because you have not bought what you thought you were buying based on all the video previews that everybody had done. So Wargaming immediately, once again, went straight to DEFCON 1 and removed him from the Community Contributor Program because he had made personal attacks against Wargaming employees. Now. I don't know what constitutes a personal attack in your neck of the woods, but where I come from, if you're personally attacking somebody, you have to at least know what that person's name is or what they look like. And he didn't make any personal attacks whatsoever against any Wargaming employees when he said that the people responsible for making the changes to the Graf Zeppelin should be fired. That's not a personal attack. It might not be the most diplomatic way of saying you screwed up and somebody needs to be made accountable for it, but, well, that's the reason that they gave for removing him from their community contributor program. Naturally, everybody lost their minds over it. The internet exploded. And the long and short of it all is that, which is really ironic, because the other thing that iChase said was he recommended everybody raise a support ticket and demand a refund if they bought this ship, thinking they were going to be getting something similar to the ship that everybody had previewed. And lo and behold, a couple of days later, Wargaming backtracked and said, <laughs> and said, if you've bought the Graf Zeppelin and you're not happy with it, raise a support ticket. <laughs> And demand a refund and we'll refund the money you've spent on this ship so I, I found that incredibly ironic and then the other thing that they did was they went back to my chase and they said yeah we're sorry we overreacted uh, would you like to rejoin the community contributor program and I chase said no and then a couple of days later he put a video up basically saying where do we go from here 
um, and explaining his reasons for declining Wargaming's invitation to rejoin their community contributors. And it all started to sound very, very familiar for me. Because iChase right now is in more or less the same position that I was in. Not exactly the same position, he was fired from the community contributor program. I resigned in protest. Um, but he's now finding that there are... I mean, look, let's make no mistake. If you do get the chance to become one of Wargaming's community contributors, whether that be for World of Tanks, World of Warships, whatever, it's a fantastic boost for your YouTube channel, particularly if you don't have a huge amount of subscribers. Um, you get early access to all kinds of ships and tanks. Uh, you get priority access to test servers. You never have to sit around in a queue waiting to get on with a test server. You're guaranteed to get on. Um, you get priority sandbox server access. You get onto the Wargaming Discord server with priority access to the community team. If you've got any questions about anything, there's always somebody there ready to give you an answer. It's all very, very useful stuff, but it does kind of come with a price. Because if you've got all of this access to all of this stuff, you do feel a responsibility to produce the video content covering all of this stuff, because not many people are in the position that you are in to enjoy that kind of access. And with the pace of releases of premium ships and premium tanks and so on and so on that Wargaming have been maintaining this last year, it's a lot of work. And iChase had found that he wasn't doing videos on new premium ships because he wanted to do them. He was doing them because he had access and he felt that he had to do a video on them. Because if you don't produce the video, then you're kind of wasting the privileges that you've been afforded by being part of the Community Contributor Program. And in some cases, um, it doesn't happen so much in World of Warships, but in World of Tanks, they only have a limited number of accounts with the new premium tank on it. And so it's a case of, well, if you're going to take one of these accounts, then we will expect a video from you. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of pressure on people um, to produce results. And if you're no longer a part of the Community Contributor Program, all of that pressure just goes away. And you can do the videos that you want to do. And I found it, when it happened to me, to be a very, very liberating feeling. I mean, it was very, very scary as well, because make no mistake, that Community Contributor Program is a very, very useful thing to be part of. But at the same time, having that pressure lifted and not having to do two world... Well, I didn't. I never really had to do two World of Tanks videos and two World of Warships videos every week, as well as a Mingles with Jingles, then a casual Saturday video, but I felt that's what people expected of me. And I kind of had to maintain that kind of publishing schedule because of all of the new stuff that I had access to that I felt I needed to make videos on. And like me, iChase is now discovering that with that pressure gone, you're free again. <laughs> it really does feel like freedom. It's a very, very liberating feeling. And a number of people were saying in the comments of iChase's video, you know, Chase, this may not be a bad thing, because, well, when this happened to Jingles, you could immediately see that he was getting excited about doing his videos again, because he was doing videos on stuff that he was passionate about, rather than just cranking out the wargaming uh, content, because he felt like he had to. Uh, and I hope you guys have noticed that as well, because I've certainly been feeling it, and I'm positive that iChase is going to be feeling the same thing as well. In fact, I'm, well, I'm, I know he is, because that's exactly why he declined Wargaming's invitation to rejoin the Community Contributor Programs. He'd had that taste of freedom, and he liked it. In the past, you could tell what day of the week it was by what my video was for the day. I mean, Monday, Mingles with Jingles. Tuesday, World of Tanks. Wednesday, World of Warships. Thursday, World of Tanks. Friday, World of Warships. Saturday, Casual Saturday. You knew that it was Tuesday because Jingles did a World of Tanks video. If I do a World of Tanks video now, it's because I want to do a World of Tanks video. Not because it's Tuesday. <laughs> right. And that's the way it should be. You know, if I pick a particular subject to do a video on, it should be because I want to do it. Not because it happens to be a certain day of the week. I mean, that's a pretty shitty reason for picking a subject for a video. These days, if you see me doing a video on cold waters, it's because I feel like doing a Cold Waters video today. And it'll be a better video because I want to do it. If you see me doing a video on World of Tanks, it's because, you know, it's been a while since I did a World of Tanks video. Let's have a look and see what we can produce. 
and it'll be a better video because I want to do that World of Tanks video, not because it's Tuesday, <laughs> which is a terrible reason for picking the subject of a video. So I'm sure I chase will be fine. Certainly didn't do me any harm. Anyway, who's up for a war story? I've actually got two war stories for you this week. The first comes from a book that I've been reading recently, uh, which I mentioned in a previous episode of Mingles with Jingles, Churchill's Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. The organisation that would grow into the Special Operations Executive in World War II. They were responsible for all manner of dirty tricks, sabotage, assassinations, you name it, they did it. Somebody actually sent me a photograph a couple of weeks back um, of what looked like a dead rat. <laughs> and it was, in fact, a dead rat. He'd found it in a museum somewhere, um, and it was one of the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare's dirty tricks. They took a whole bunch of dead rats, uh, preserved them, and stuffed them full of explosives. And then they would send these explosive rats over to occupied France, where the Germans were turning the French factories uh, into war factories. And they would get people to scatter these dead rats around the place. Now, the janitors and the groundskeepers at these factories were responsible, amongst other things, for keeping the rat population down. So they'd be laying rat poison all over the place. And then every day, as part of their duties, somebody would have to go around and collect the bodies of all the dead rats and then throw them into the furnace. And mixed amongst all of these poisoned rats would be these explosive rats. <laughs> And what happens when you toss an explosive rat into a furnace? Yeah, the rat explodes, takes out the furnace, starts a fire, puts the factory out of action, hopefully for a few days or longer. You never know your luck. So that's exactly the sort of thing that the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare was coming up with. But what I wanted to talk about today is one of their slightly more conventional operations, and it's to do with the sabotage of the Norsk Hydro Plant. Now, you might have heard of this. You may have even seen the movie that was made about it, The Heroes of Telemark. You see, the reason the Norsk Hydro Plant in Norway was so important was because it was producing deuterium oxide, also known as heavy water. And deuterium oxide is a vital component in the production of plutonium. And if Hitler could get his hands on enough deuterium oxide, he could begin the development of atomic weapons. And Hitler knew this very well. An intelligence report in 1940 indicated that German scientists had requested an immediate increase in production of deuterium oxide at Norsk Hydro to £300 a year, and in 1942 the output had increased again to £10,000 a year. So clearly the Nazis were entirely aware of how important this stuff was. So knocking this place out was put right at the top of the British War Cabinet's hit list. You couldn't bomb the place from the air. A ground assault by the army was completely out of the question. That meant the only option remaining was sabotage. And that was where the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare stepped in. They'd already recruited a whole bunch of Europeans of various different nationalities who fled Nazi occupation and come to Britain to continue the fight. And amongst them was a highly competent Norwegian army captain called Martin Linger, who was in command of Norwegian Independent Company No. 1 a bunch of Norwegian nationals who had been training with the Special Operations Executive and learning all kinds of dirty tricks since the fall of Norway earlier that year. The original plan was a two-part attack. First, Norwegian specialists would be parachuted in in order to do reconnaissance on the hydro plant and lay the groundwork for the main attack, which would be conducted by British Army commandos flown in in gliders. The first part of the operation went off flawlessly, the second part of the operation, the commando attack, was an utter disaster. Two of the gliders crash-landed, killing 15 of the commandos and seriously wounding most of the rest. The survivors were captured within days, the lucky ones were just executed immediately, and the rest were all tortured and then killed. Three of the men were taken to a local hospital where a Nazi collaborator came up with a particularly gruesome way of killing them by injecting air bubbles into their veins, just as one example. In response to this first failed commando attack, the Germans immediately beefed up security around the hydro plant, which made a second commando attack completely out of the question. So, if they were going to get this done, it was going to have to be a very small team of highly trained professional saboteurs. A 23-year-old Norwegian physical endurance instructor, working at one of the Scottish SOE training camps by the name of Joachim Ronneberg, 
was approached and asked if he could take on a job in Norway and pick five men to go with him. He immediately accepted, since being forced to flee from Norway two years earlier, he'd been waiting for the moment to strike back. Now he was going to get his chance. He knew exactly which five men he wanted to take with him, and I'm probably going to make a real dog's breakfast out of pronouncing their names here, but I'll, I'll, I'll have a go. Berger Stromsheim, he wanted as his second in command. The other four were Knut Hokelid, Frederick Kaiser, Kasper Idland, and Hans Storhaug. He got them all together and he said to them, Look, I've been picked to do a job. I don't know what it is. All I know is we're going back to Norway and I want you five to come with me. Are you in? And they all cheered. <laughs> and that was the only answer he needed. They were given an unusually complete dossier of information about the Norsk hydro plant and it had come from three impeccable sources. The first of these was Professor Leif Tronstadt, who was a pioneering atomic scientist who had actually worked at Norsk Hydro during the 1930s and overseen the production of the heavy water there. He had um, balked at the Nazi demand to increase the quantities being produced. Instead, he tried to sabotage the existing stocks by adding drops of cod liver oil. But the Germans soon began to suspect him, and he had little option but to flee to England in the summer of 1941. But he was able to give the SOE a detailed account of the factory's layout. SOE soon found themselves with even more up-to-date information. Professor Tronstadt's place had been filled by Jomar Brunn, another Norwegian patriot who secretly took micro-photographs of the plant, concealed them in toothpaste tubes, and managed to get them smuggled to London. When Brunn came under suspicion, he also fled to England and offered his services to the Special Operations Executive. But the most extraordinary source of information had come just eight months earlier, when Einar Skinnerland, a 23-year-old engineer at Norsk Hydro, suddenly turned up in London. <laughs> We're not making this up, OK? He had told his German employees at the plant that he was in desperate need of a holiday, so they gave him two weeks off. He and five comrades hijacked a 600-tonne coastal steamer and ordered its captain at gunpoint to sail for Aberdeen in Scotland. Once ashore, he made his way to London, warned the SOE of the huge increase in production of heavy water and hand-delivered him the latest plans of the factory, along with all of the operational activities. Now, you might have thought that they would have reasonably rewarded young Mr Skinnerland by giving him a desk job. Instead, they persuaded him to be parachuted back into Norway, where he was to return to the hydro plant after his little holiday in London, uh, so that he could continue to supply SOE with the latest information about the factory, its sentries and its points of access. Skinnerlander did exactly that, arrived for work after two weeks' absence, cheerfully informing his colleagues that he had enjoyed a very relaxing break. <laughs> Balls of steel, that man. Anyway, in order to ensure that Ronnenberg's team knew exactly what they were doing and exactly what to blow up in order to disable Norsk Hydro's heavy water production, they were going to have to make an exact replica of the heavy water room. And so, at a place called Brickendary Manor, which was run by Special Operations Executive, one of the stable outbuildings was turned into exactly that, a one-to-one -one scale replica of the Norsk Hydro heavy water plant room. The men were also given the exact plans of the rest of the factory, down to the very last detail. None of them had ever been to the factory in their lives, but by the time they'd finished their training, they knew the layout of the place as well as anybody. On the 16th of February 1943, the operation was given the go-ahead, and Ronnenberg's six-man team of Norwegian saboteurs were flown the 700 miles to Norway in a Royal Air Force Stirling bomber, thrown out the door, landed, and within a couple of days made contact with, do you remember Captain Martin Linger? Norwegian Independent Company No. 1. They'd been dropped in ahead of the aborted commando raid just over a month earlier, they were still there. <laughs> Patiently waiting for Ronnenberg's saboteurs to arrive, living in rough in caves in the mountains, in the middle of blizzards and the Norwegian winter. And they hadn't been idle for the last month. They were still doing reconnaissance on the hydro plant, and there was bad news because the Germans had dramatically increased security. Guards were now posted all around the factory. The garrison had been increased to 200 troops. Four anti-aircraft guns had been installed, along with banks of machine guns. Floodlights illuminated the entire perimeter, and a tracking station had been built, which made it nearly impossible for anybody to use radios without being detected anywhere within miles of the factory. So, the ten Norwegians sat down and decided that the only way to get into the plant 
was to descend to the bottom of the deep gorge, cross the river, and then climb the other side. See, the Germans believed that the gorge couldn't be climbed without specialist mountain equipment. But the Norwegians weren't so sure. One of them had studied the Royal Air Force reconnaissance photographs, and he noticed that there was a segment of the gorge where fir trees grew all the way from the top right down to the bottom. And, he said, where trees grow, a man can make his way. If the gorge could be climbed, there was a unique weak point in the German defences. A single-track railway line had been hacked into the side of the ravine, hundreds of feet from the bottom. It provided access into the plant, but it was only ever used to transport heavy machinery. As far as Ronnenberg knew, it wasn't guarded by the Germans, but it was visible from the suspension bridge. Nevertheless, at precisely 0030 hours, the following morning, that's exactly what they did, and were able to gain access to the factory grounds without being observed. They split into two teams, one of which would stay above ground, covering the German guard posts, and each team armed with a complete set of explosives in case one of the teams failed. The second team would actually make the entry into the hydro plant itself. There was a cellar door that was supposed to have been left unlocked by one of Skinnerland's contacts, but it failed to open because the man responsible for leaving it open had fallen ill and been unable to go to work. But Ronnenberg didn't panic because he knew from his training at Brickendenbury Manor that there was another means to enter the heavy water plant. There was a narrow cable shaft which led through the bedrock directly into the plant room. So he and Frederick Kayser now climbed up a short ladder, crawled into the shaft, pulled themselves along on their hands and knees. When they reached the end of the shaft, they slid down into the outer plant room, approached the high concentration room in absolute silence and pushed at the door. It was unlocked. They burst inside and overwhelmed the one Norwegian night guard. Then they unpacked their explosives and began attaching them to the metal cylinder shafts. They were struck by the accuracy of the models that had been built back in England. The actual machinery was identical, and the charges that had been made fitted like a glove. They'd already placed half of the charges when there was the sound of shattering glass as one of the windows was pushed in. Ronnenberg spun around in alarm, only to see Stronsheim and Idland climbing down into the room. Having failed to find the cable tunnel, they decided to act on their own initiative, which meant that both groups of saboteurs had made it into the factory without being seen. When all of the fuses were attached to the charges, they were checked while Ronnenberg coupled them in preparation for detonation. The original plan had been to set the time delays to two minutes, but as everything had gone so well up to now, they didn't want to run the risk of anyone coming in and spotting their work, so they changed the fuses to 30 seconds. <laughs> They were just about to light the fuses when the Norwegian guard, still held at gunpoint, asked if he could fetch his spectacles before they were blown up in the explosion, because they're impossible to get in Norway these days, he explained. So they let the poor guy go and get his glasses and then told him to take cover on the floor above. Ronnenberg then lit the fuses and gave a signal to the other three men, time to get out. All of them rushed outside using the steel cellar door to take cover, and they weren't further than 20 yards from the building when they heard the muffled thud of an explosion. Newt Hocklid, above ground, covering the German guard posts, was still hiding behind a bunch of barrels when the detonation occurred. He'd been expecting a massive explosion of ball of fire. Instead, it was, well, kind of insignificant. <laughs> he was very disappointed. Was this what we'd come over a thousand miles to do, he asked himself. I mean, certainly the windows were broken and a glimmer of light spread out into the night, but it wasn't particularly impressive. But this is exactly what the explosives designer, George Ream, had intended. They'd been specially designed to wreak maximum damage with minimum risk to the saboteurs. The charge was a work of genius because it imploded into the machinery rather than exploding outwards. It was, however, loud enough to attract the attentions of the German guards in the sentry hut. One of them opened the door of the hut but didn't show any sign of alarm, flashed a torch in the direction of the Norwegian guardhouse and then disappeared back into the hut. The ten men then regrouped on the railway track, not quite believing that they'd managed to get in and out of the plant without being spotted, and still, unnoticed by anybody, they began climbing back down the ravine until they reached the bottom. They managed to cross the ice bridge without mishap and were about to start climbing the other side when the first siren sounded. This was the German signal for general mobilisation in the area. They at last collected their wits and found out what had happened. It was clear that the hunt was now on. On the other side of the valley, away on the railway line, they could see the lights of electric torches moving about. The German guards had discovered their line of retreat, so the ten of them collected the skis that they'd hidden some hours earlier and began climbing rapidly upwards through the forest and onto the mountainside. 
Within three hours, they had reached the bleak expanse of the Hardinger Plateau, which afforded some degree of safety, and after covering a further seven miles, they took their first break. They travelled over a thousand miles, broken into one of the most heavily guarded installations in all of occupied Europe, destroyed machinery vital to the Nazi atomic weapons program, gotten out again, and they hadn't even fired their weapons. <laughs> They hadn't stabbed anybody, they hadn't shot anybody, they'd done the whole thing without killing a single person. A couple of days later, SOE received further news about the destruction, including a report from a Norwegian agent working inside the plant. He'd arrived less than 10 minutes after the explosion. His report said it was at once evident that the object of the action had been achieved. Each one of the 18 cells had been blown to pieces and their contents of lye and heavy water had long since run off into the drains. And it wasn't just the high concentration heavy water cells that had been knocked out, but also the water tubes feeding the plant. On the 10th of March, 10 days after the attack, SOE received the sweetest news of all. A message was received from another agent at the plant, describing the visit to Norsk Hydro of General von Falkenhorst, the commander of the occupying German forces in Norway. At the sight of the ruined plant, he smiled and said, This is the most splendid coup I have seen in this war. A consummate professional, he admired the saboteur's work and conceded that they had pulled off a dazzling act of destruction. Once he had inspected the damage, he ordered the release of all the Norwegian civilians who had been rounded up for reprisals, and then issued a second order that all of the German sentries on duty that night were to be arrested. Their eventual fate remains unknown, although the senior guard was later said to have been sent to the Eastern Front. And that was the story of the raid on the Norsk hydro plant, planned by the British but carried out by the Norwegians. And the second war story that I wanted to share with you in this week's episode of Mingles with Jingles is of a slightly more personal nature, or at least it is for Gareth Petley, the guy who contacted me with this story. These are the Petley brothers of Southampton, who all joined the Royal Navy at the outbreak of hostilities in World War II. One of them, Ernest Petley, is Gareth Petley's grandfather. And in 1942, leading seaman Ernest Petley was stationed on board this. It's not much of a warship really, is it? It's because it isn't a warship at all. This is a 600-ton merchant vessel called the SS Monmouth Coast. The reason Leiden Seaman Petley of the Royal Navy was serving on board an armed merchantman was because it was an armed merchantman. It was armed with a 12-pounder deck gun, and Leiden Seaman Petley was the gunner in charge of the gun. The ship was owned by a company called Coastlines Limited, which were based in Liverpool, and as such they did a lot of business with Ireland. And it was while in the Irish Sea, that the Monmouth coast came under attack by three German aircraft, two fighters and one bomber. The ship wasn't operating as part of a convoy system, there were no escorts, it was just the Monmouth coast, that one 12 pounder deck gun, and two German fighters and one German bomber. With bombs exploding all around the ship, and with the decks being strafed by machine gun fire which killed one of the gun crew, leading Seaman Petley very calmly organised the firing of the gun and with seven shots fired, shot down the bomber and one of the fighters. That's not bad going. Seven shots, two kills. Driving off the surviving fighter, he pretty much saved the ship. As a result of his actions on that day in 1942, Leiden Seaman Petley was awarded the British Empire Medal. Now, this may not seem like a particularly stirring war story, particularly not if you contrast it to the story of the raid on the Norsk hydro plant. So why am I finishing this week's episode of Mingles with Jingles with this particular story. Well, sadly, Leiden Seaman Petley is no longer with us. His son, Ernest Jr., however, is, although not for much longer. He's recently suffered a fairly severe decline in his health and is suffering from rapid-onset vascular dementia. And so this is why Leiden Seaman Petley's grandson, Ernest Petley Jr.'s son, got in touch with me wanting to know if there was any way I could help pay tribute to Leiden Seaman Petley's exploits in World War II, while his son, Gareth Petley's father, still retains enough of his mental faculties to appreciate it. And Gareth, I'm entirely happy to do so. Your grandfather may not have been the kind of hero that has war movies made about them, like the Norwegian saboteurs of the Norsk hydro plant, but he was certainly a hero to the crew of the SS Monmouth Coast on that day in 1942, when he saved the ship from destruction at the hands of three German aircraft. And that is it for this week's episode of Mingles with Jingles. I hope you've enjoyed it, and as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.